Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone, wherever in the world you may be joining us from today. My name is Francesco Del Carpio, and I am the CFL York Operations Coordinator. I would like to officially open the third session of the Climate Change Displacement Dialogue Series, presented in partnership with the Center for Refugee Studies at York University, York Emergency Mitigation, Engagement, Response, and Governance Institute, CFL Philippines, the University of the Philippines Resilience Institute, and Antalaya Billam University. I would like to begin today's session with a land acknowledgement. We acknowledge and recognize that many Indigenous nations have long-standing relationships with the territory upon which our campuses are located that precede the establishment of York University. The area is known as Tecoronto and has been caretaken by the Anishinaabek Nation, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, and the Huron-Wendat. It is now home to many First Nation Inuit and Métis communities. We acknowledge the current treaty holders, the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation, and that the territory is subject to the to the Dish With One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant, an agreement to peaceably share and care for the Great Lakes region. As this is an online event, our participants may be joining from various locations, so I strongly encourage you to learn about the traditional land upon which you are located. With this, I welcome our moderator, our speaker, and our participants from around the world. Welcome to our webinar. It is now my great pleasure to introduce today's moderator, Nilanjana Ganguly, or Nell. Nell is a PhD candidate at the Faculty of Environmental and Urban Change at York University. Her work employs an intersectional systems thinking and participatory approach to develop strategies for improving health resilience among women engaged in transactional sex in Malawi's gendered natural resource economies, particularly in the Lake Chilwa Basin. Nell holds a master's degree in environmental studies and a bachelor's in biotechnology from York University. From 2022 to 2024, Nell served as the project manager for the Data Lake Institute's Complex Adaptive Modeling of the Health Impacts of Climate Change in Malawi project. She currently contributes as a graduate research assistant and grant writer for the Malawi team and volunteers as a grant manager for the Leadership of Environment and Development Southern and Eastern Africa. Nell, thank you very much for moderating today's session. The floor is yours. Thank you, Francesco. Um, welcome, everyone. Uh, welcome to our third session of our series. Uh, in the first session, Dr. Yvonne Su, who is also joining us as a moderator, uh, gave us a really good overview <laughs> on climate-related migration and displacement. The second session was uh, conducted by Dr. Will Greaves, who presented uh, on climate-related migration within Canada. And today, we will hear from Dr. Bauer, about the complexities of land relocation. So welcome, Erica. Um, Dr. Erica Bauer is a researcher at Human Rights Watch with a decade of experience studying how climate change affects human mobility and advocating for policies that better protect people's rights on the move. She's a member of the Platform on Disaster Displacement Advisory Committee and an affiliate of the Caldor Center. Previously, she worked with diverse organizations, including UNHCR, IDMC and the Nansen Initiative. She holds a PhD in planned relocation governance from Stanford, uh, MSc in refugee and forced migration studies from Oxford, and a BA in human rights and sustainable de development from Columbia. Um, before I hand it over to Erica, I just wanted to go through, uh, go over some housekeeping rules quickly. So the session will be ending sharply at one. Erica will present for 40 minutes. Uh, we will have a short Q&A session from 12.50 to around 1. Uh, so please send us your questions in the Q&A um, chat box, uh, Q&A box. Um, and uh, I, will I and Dr. Sue will facilitate the Q&A session and pose your questions to Erica. Um, today's session is being recorded uh, and the content will be available on the CFAL website and YouTube. And we welcome you to revisit the content yourself and share with your colleagues. Um, Erica, the floor is all yours. Thank you so much for that kind introduction. And truly, it is an honor to be here with you all today. So I will present the findings from a few different research projects related to my doctoral research and also to current work at Human Rights Watch all focused on a common theme, the title that you see on the screen, reimagining this concept of community engagement, lessons from climate-related planned relocation of communities. To start, 
I want to tell you the story of the Guna indigenous people living on a tiny island called Gardi Sagdeb off the Caribbean coast of Panama. They have loved this island home for over a hundred years. Yet life was hard because as you can see in the figure, there's no space and sea level rise and annual floods have threatened their access to drinking water, sanitation and education. The school was quite literally falling into the sea. As a result, back in 2010, the community made an extremely challenging decision. They decided to relocate to a new safer site on the mainland. They plan to move from that island you saw on the previous slide to this mainland site, Isperiala. It's a visually striking contrast. In this new site, they're safer from sea level rise and they have better access to school but also the new site faces erosion during heavy rains and there are concerns about loss of culture and loss of traditional livelihoods. After years of waiting, the new site was finally ready this past May and all 300 homes are now occupied. They've been there for about six months. But what will happen? Will people stay? Will they be safer? Will they be better off? Will they perceive the move to be just? Only time will tell. If you're interested to learn more about the case, there's a QR code in the upper right side of the screen. I share this story to really show that this is not a future hypothetical, but a current reality. Whole communities are already moving. They're already planning relocations because of climate change impacts. But policies don't often exist. And when they do, they're not always the best informed. Decision makers need better evidence to make better decisions. And that's really the starting point for this talk today. So let's dive in. As will come as no surprise to any of you on this call, climate change will make many hazards more intense and frequent. Our focus here is on sea level rise and floods. These are hazards that are already th threatening the habitability of land and endangering people's lives, livelihoods, and the very idea of home. Facing these sobering realities, communities and governments are exploring approaches to reduce these risks and adapt. Adaptation efforts typically fall into three categories. Measures to resist a coastal hazard, like building a seawall. Measures to accommodate that hazard, like building a house on stilts. Or measures to move away from the hazard, a phenomenon that has many names, managed retreat, resettlement, here we call it planned relocation. People want to stay in their homes. Movement is traumatic. It's often considered a measure of last resort. Yet it's increasingly discussed as a viable climate change adaptation option, because unlike other more incremental strategies to resist or accommodate coastal hazards, planned relocation has the potential to eliminate flood exposure completely and under the right conditions, can be transformational. As the climate crisis accelerates, some movement is inevitable. Migration scholars will tell you that human movements take wide varieties of forms, ranging from the forced to the voluntary, the temporary to the permanent. Planned relocation, again, is unique as a type of human movement because it's permanent, it takes place at the community scale, it involves a shared destination site, and it involves coordination or assistance from some supporting actor, which of course leads to unique governance challenges. Well-planned relocation can be a way to avoid the emotional, social, and economic costs of forced displacement. It can also be a durable solution for people who have already lost their homes. According to the Internal Displacement Monitoring Center report that was published just this year, 26.4 million people were displaced by disasters in 2023 alone. And this number is growing over time. When well-planned, relocation can help minimize, avert, address some of these impacts of displacement. So getting planned relocation right could help millions of people. Planned relocations are already happening around the world. In a global mapping of English, Spanish, French, and Portuguese literature 
Um, this was put together by the Platform on Disaster Displacement and UNSW Caldor Center. You can see the QR code here on the left. Colleagues and I found over 400 cases of these whole community-wide relocations across all inhabited continents. This is already happening. Gardi Sadab is not alone. And according to the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change Working Group 2 Technical Summary, planned relocations are likely to happen more as climate change intensifies. Despite the rising salience of hazard-related planned relocation, empirical research is still limited and characterized by at least three gaps. First, most research to date is a single case study, which is vitally important, but it doesn't allow us to see patterns across contexts that might help for generalized policy-relevant insights. Second, most research relies on a single disciplinary perspective, which prevents the assessment of trade-offs across domains. And third, there is little systematic focus on outcomes, which is critical because, as I've already alluded to, planned relocations frequently have mixed track records. Much of what we assume we know about climate-related relocations to date comes from analogies to development or dam-related resettlement, which are different contexts, so these analogies have limited applicability. To address these three gaps, my research leverages comparative and unapologetically interdisciplinary approaches to assess outcomes. There's a tendency among academics, policymakers, civil society, practitioners, the media, to uncritically label certain planned relocation cases as a success or successful. The coastal village of Vuni de Lagoa in Fiji and the riverine community of Valmeyer in the United States, among others, are often heralded as such examples. And this has been happening since the 1990s, but still a consensus on what this term success means does not exist. These are deceivingly complex questions that are front and center in the minds of practitioners and policymakers, and they're the core motivation for my research. What does success look like? How do we measure it? And then from a practical perspective, what might contribute to more quote unquote successful outcomes? These questions are of course not unique to planned relocation. They also exist in broader conversations about managed retreat, climate mobility, and climate adaptation generally. So what precisely is meant by success? There's a lot of different ways to think about this. There are trade-offs across population types, thinking about success for whom, according to whom, across space, across time. Are we just thinking about the year 2030 or also 2100, generations into the future? And then also there are questions about domain. Is the goal merely for people who are relocating to survive? Or is it for them to thrive, to address historical inequities and injustices? You can think about success from the prism of risk reduction, justice, or livelihoods. Today, we're going to focus on this paradigm, thinking about success in terms of people's livelihoods. In that global mapping that I mentioned earlier, we saw that relocations can have negative socioeconomic outcomes for people's livelihoods. For example, the fisher folk in Vuni de Lagoa, Fiji, the picture you see here, were moved from the coastland to higher elevation. Are they expected to become farmers overnight when they get to this new site? Together with colleagues Anvesh, Chris, and Gabrielle, we explored this question. What planning decisions are associated with improved livelihood outcomes for relocated communities? To address this question, we conducted a comparative analysis of all cases from that global database that met certain criteria. They were initiated in relation to floods. There was a completed move, meaning that the, we could evaluate outcomes. There was only one origin and one destination site, so a common spatial pattern. And we could find adequate documentation. That last criteria meant that we could find at least one prior study where another researcher had interviewed relocated people. We did not visit these cases ourselves, although of course that's vitally important, 
Instead, we conducted a meta-analysis of sorts, synthesizing across the rich, in-depth case studies that were already completed. Through synthesis of available scholarly and gray literature, we systematically identified, coded, and calibrated information on relocation planning and livelihood outcomes for each of the 14 cases that met our criteria. And you can see those 14 cases here. To assess livelihood outcomes, we chose the sustainable livelihoods approach. In contrast to understanding livelihoods narrowly in an economic sense, this approach offers a more multidimensional understanding of human needs. Typically, the paradigm includes five categories. So this means we were evaluating if after a relocation, a community X has better access to schools or community Y has more cohesive family and, and community unity, or they have access to a house, access to markets, they had food security. And we also added into this natural category, hazard type, whether or not they were still exposed to ongoing climate hazards, although that's not always included in the SLA approach. And we also added a sixth category with cultural dimensions, like connection to land, heritage, ritual, these are un understudied aspects of livelihoods, but they're essential to consider in relocation contexts, particularly for indigenous communities. This approach has been applied by other scholars in this field and was well aligned with our objectives in this study. It enabled us to assess change and access to assets as a result of the relocation through comparing cases with different baselines at the community scale and by looking at many different aspects of people's needs. So what planning dimensions did we consider? In this study, we tested the role of five decisions that are potentially important, consistently measurable across cases, and viable for possible planning intervention. First, as comes as no surprise to anyone given the title of this talk, we expected that processes where community members were engaged at all of the stages, like in Gardi Sugdab, the community I mentioned earlier, cases where they decided whether, where, and how to relocate. Those were the cases that were associated with the most positive outcomes based on increased control and agency. Second, we expected that a staggered approach, starting with relocating only those who are most in, in need, allowing for some voluntary immobility might lead to good outcomes, but also a synchronized approach that would help minimize communities from falling apart would also be critical. Third, fourth, and fifth, we expected that the distance between the origin and destination site, the speed at which people moved, and the scale of the community would also really matter for livelihood outcomes. So literature has extensively studied each of these factors independently and finds they're all critical for outcomes, but they're interdependent and they're mutually reinforcing. So we needed to know how pathways or combinations of factors resulted in better or worse livelihood outcomes to make more informed and evidence-based policy decisions. To explore this question, we used a method called fuzzy set qualitative comparative analysis, which is really a novel method that uses set theory to identify patterns in case characteristics that lead to certain outcomes. It's well suited to study complex causality and for medium sample sizes that are challenging to study with other methods. So two of us coded and calibrated all the outcomes and all the planning decisions for 14 cases. We weighted all of those outcomes equally, and then we identified causal pathways. So which of these conditions are most important across those 14 cases? This is what we found. Perhaps again, unsurprisingly, given the title of this talk, we found that community engagement was always the most important factor, but that there were two paths that led to the most improved livelihood outcomes. Across both, community engagement really matters, but it matters in combination with different factors. For larger communities, we found that relocating on a shorter time horizons with high community engagement led to the best outcomes. For instance, in Valmire in the United States, residents served critical roles in site selection and site development. Within eight weeks of the day of the first floodwaters entering the village, seven different communities composed of more than 100 different village residents were created. In contrast, for smaller communities, we found that 
longer time horizons with efforts to keep the entire community together as a unit with a synchronized transfer led to better livelihood outcomes. So for example, in Vuni de Lagoa and Fiji, the entire community stayed together throughout the process. We wanted to make sure that these findings were not just because of how we coded the data. So we tried lots of different parameters and ways of calibrating. And in every robustness test, we found that community engagement always em emerged as the most important factor. So when we think about measuring success from the perspective of people's livelihoods, we learned that community engagement really matters. The more members drive decisions about whether, where, and how to move, the better the outcomes. This is in contrast to, say, a government or an NGO or international organization making those decisions on behalf of the community without their inputs. This is not new. It's probably a really intuitive finding to many of you on this call. But our study adds a systematic and a global perspective to prior findings. We also found that the pace of a relocation influences outcomes, but in contrasting ways for small and large communities. And surprisingly, we found that distance between old and new sites was not as critical for success in this sample of cases as we expected. One possible explanation is that elevation change matters more than horizontal distance. Another is that cultural and jurisdictional ideas of distance make more of a difference than the absolute number of kilometers. You can see a QR code if you're interested to learn more about this study. And I really want to spend the rest of this talk really unpacking that first line, community engagement matters. What does that actually mean in practice? The rest of this presentation include questions that I found myself grappling with while I was writing this first study. And I think it's a really powerful illustration of the value of interdisciplinary research, both for scholarship and for policy and practice. So this concept of community is central to plant relocation. It's part of the very definition of what a relocating process looks like. It's a community scale. And if you ask any practitioner or policymaker, this principle of engage communities, engage communities, engage communities is front and center. If you look at guidance that's developed by national governments in Fiji and Solomon Islands, if you look at guidance that's developed by international institutions, like, for example, um, a toolbox that was developed in 2017 by UNHCR, IOM, and Brookings, or a guidance instrument developed by Brookings and Georgetown back in 2015, you'll see that this concept of community engagement and participation is front and center. But community is a buzzword, and diverse scholars have challenged the usefulness of this concept of community in development and disaster disciplines. So what can we learn from both the scholarship and also the policy and practice to create a more comprehensive framework for actually fostering genuine, authentic, inclusive community engagement? When we started asking these questions, we realized that this was the status quo. The most common framework for how people think about community engagement in planned relocation is as follows. There are two umbrella groups. There are these internal actors who will relocate, the quote unquote community. And then there is this external bucket of external actors facilitating the process, whether it's a government or an NGO or an IO, an international organization. While this binary conceptualization offers many practical benefits, it also obscures the dynamic nature of how community engagement develops throughout each stage of the relocation process. In pursuit of a more nuanced conceptual framework, we raise three questions that we think policymakers, practitioners, and relocating people themselves should ask when developing engagement strategies in planned relocation contexts. First, who constitutes the community? Second, who is facilitating the relocation process? And third, what is meaningful engagement over time. Let's turn to that first question. 
Consider Ile de Jean Charles, a community off the coast of Louisiana. This tribe applied for federal funding from HUD in the United States using a cultural definition of community. They were referring to everyone with the same tribal identity. However, others in the government used a definition of community that was spatial. They thought it meant everyone who's living on this island, including people that did not belong to that tribe, but excluding people who belonged to the tribe but had already faced the consequences of sea level rise and coastal erosion and had moved to the mainland. They were not part of the picture at first. I highlight that example just to illustrate that there are diverse spatial, cultural, legal, and social definitions of community and that this might change across time throughout the duration of a relocation process. The definition of community is often fluid with all of these multiple elements, leading to inconsistent definitions about who should be engaged. There's also this assumption that's frankly often problematic of homogeneity. Communities engaging in planned relocations are not monoliths. Members may have differing opinions about whether or how to relocate based on different ages, genders, disability, lived experiences, place attachments. As just one example, in the community of Gardi Sugdab in Panama that I mentioned earlier, older generations really wanted to stay on the island, while younger generations saw the move as more of a promising step towards modernity and a better future. Clearly, communities are not homogeneous, and this unspoken assumption that the term community is shorthand for a homogeneous group of people that hold identical perspectives is a flawed one. As just another example, a local mayor or a tribal leader may be part of that community, geographically speaking, but they're also holding positions of power that make their role and their opinions distinct from others. So this illusion of consensus is not always there. So this brings us to the second question. Who is facilitating the planned relocation process? What about that local mayor in Valmeyer, Illinois? or the chief of Ile de Jean Charles in Louisiana. They're both internal community members, but they also hold those positions of power. What about the provincial government official in Taro, the provincial capital of Choisel province in the Solomon Islands? Again, this is a stakeholder that's external, but also plays a slightly different kind of a role. To capture the important role of those who sort of transcend this relocating and facilitating domain, we introduced this concept of intermediaries. These are crucial actors who operate both within and outside of different stakeholder groups to drive these relocation processes. Identifying the role of these individuals is important because they're often under-recognized in community engagement strategies, but often they're the most critical stakeholders for communication, for representation, and they might help or hinder community engagement that's meaningful. Identifying the roles of these intermediaries is important to avoid reproducing the inequities and creating spaces for community voices to actually be included at all stages. So to understand how communities are being engaged and participating, it's essential therefore to not just consider whether or not they're included, but rather to examine this whole complex system, including who is involved, who leads, and how. Which brings us then to the third question that I posed. How can community engagement be meaningful over time in light of a lot of the challenges around power dynamics that I've alluded to? Despite good intentions, there's a real danger of what some call community washing, using this term and misrepresenting community needs to meet other stakeholders' goals. Recognizing this, we're trying to examine the interactions between communities and those facilitating to understand implications for meaningful engagement. Because of course, many challenges arise. One common problem that we've seen across a range of cases occurs when community members are named in a relocation process tokenistically, but they're not meaningfully engaged. Another problem is a lack of trust in local representation, trust in those intermediaries, which might happen when consultation during the relocation planning is insufficient, or if 
the stated preferences of community members loses priority and it's not actually carried forward into decision making. These embedded power dynamics can also lead to potential elite capture, which occurs when elites from any level of government or civil society change a project or capture financial or physical assets or other informal benefits for their own gain. Clearly, there are a lot of challenges that can occur in these processes. And I'll add one more, which is that engagement is not a one-time requirement, but something that must happen continuously over time, during the stage of initiation, but also during the stages of site selection and site development. It should be continuous, dynamic, and iterative throughout the process of deciding whether, where, and how to relocate. And yet in practice, we don't often see that engagement is consistent. It usually ebbs and flows. So the question is, how do you build in those mechanisms um, to ensure that it's con consistent throughout all stages? It's probably obvious that not all types of community engagement in planned relocation processes are equal. And this was a huge point of reflection in writing up the discussion section from the paper that I wrote about earlier and that I shared earlier using FSQCA. For that paper, we had to code relocation engagement as binary, yes, no, or a fuzzy set scale, which allows a little bit more complexity. But in practice, community engagement is not a binary, absent or present. McAdam and Ferris articulate a participation spectrum tailored to planned relocation projects. And this builds on earlier ideas from Einstein's ladder of citizen participation. This ladder of this spectrum includes a range of different engagement strategies. On the one hand, there are passive participation approaches where the affected population is informed, but not necessarily heard, such as through dissemination of documents or public briefings by officials. As just one example, in the relocation of La Barquita in the Dominican Republic, community members were not able to design the project, the new site themselves, but they were required to attend trainings on the rules of living in the new site. Their participation did not make them, quote unquote, active agents in the decision-making process, and thus did not change power relations regarding the formulation and execution of the project. That's a quote from Hamdush and Galvin, 2019, who evaluated this case. By contrast, there are other planned relocation cases, like for instance, Ensaida de Balea in Brazil, where affected populations really do take initiative. The project is conceived and run by the community at all stages. In this particular example that I mentioned from Brazil, community members initiated the process of relocating and when they were offered a potential option from government authorities, they actually rejected the solution because integrating with another community or moving to an urban area would have changed their lifestyle, traditions, and systems of organization. So to pursue their goals and their local initiative, they ultimately decided to establish collectives of, of free mutual help um, like mutual aid societies, that would be the equivalent in North America. Um, and that, this is really a compelling example of a community-led process where they truly had control at all stages. There are also plenty of communities that have established protocols and mechanisms for engagement. For example, in Ile de Jean Charles in Louisiana. And of course, those protocols should be recognized and respected by governments and other stakeholders. I share this sort of spectrum of community engagement strategies because there's a lot of diversity out there and comparing across regional global contexts is of course challenging. Um, we have to appreciate local context when comparing practices, but still regardless of context, a lot of research and guidance, policy guidance suggests that to improve outcomes of these relocation processes, engagement opportunities should nudge up that ladder should try to align with that highest rung of community-driven community approaches, local initiative control, 
in human rights language, we would call it a right to self-determination. So I highlight this slide to show that the key contributions of this paper is a conceptual framework of key questions with implications for policy. So when any, whenever a stakeholder is developing a policy on planned relocation, we need to make sure that these three questions are interrogated. First, what constitutes the community? What are the different definitions? How are they being used iteratively over time? And then how we tackle that tricky illusion of consensus, which voices are being upheld and whose are being silenced? How can that engagement be more inclusive systematically? Second, who is facilitating that relocation? And what are the implications of that configuration of stakeholders? What is that critical role of the intermediaries that span both the internal and the external stakeholder groups? How are they helping or hindering engagement? And finally, what is truly meaningful about this engagement? How can it achieve that highest rung of the ladder? How can you sustain that over time at multiple stages of the process? And if there are challenges like naming without engagement, loss of trust and elite capture, how can they be addressed and power be contested? Um, how can this power contestation be addressed in a systematic way? The questions raised here can also inform future relocation policymaking and practice. And I'll just share two examples. The recent Solomon Islands government planned relocation guidelines were rather unique in that they acknowledged the diverse and dynamic definitions of community that emerged through consultation and allowed the definition of the scope of who is included in community to change for different purposes. Rather than prescribing one definition, this approach offers opportunities for meaningful engagement by creating space for people to decide what, what, what community means to them and um, adapt this based on context. Second, the office um, of Fiji, the Fijian government's standard operating procedures to operationalize their policy include an example where the government has taken a first step at standardizing procedures that enshrine community involvement over time at all stages of the process and are inclusive of diverse subpopulations. So they actually include quotas about the number of women, older people, et cetera, that have to be consulted at all stages. Although those quotas are challenging to meet when you're talking about a really small population. So whether either of these two tools and examples actually achieve their intended outcomes remains to be seen, but I highlight them to illustrate novel pathways towards shifting how communities and community engagement is being conceived in relocation planning as promising practices for others to continue to explore. The takeaway from this is that community engagement is essential, but at the same time, it's not a panacea. Defining and centering the community in planned relocation requires more nuanced discourse about how to move beyond the tokenistic information sharing towards consultation and efforts that really empower people to lead on the decision-making and planning for their futures. Takeaways from this paper include that communities and climate-related planned relocation are of course not a monolith operating in consensus, who constitutes community should be iteratively evaluated throughout the relocation. Intermediaries play crucial roles and they're often overlooked actors that are bridging the community and the facilitating spaces. Really developing strategies to maximize their strengths is essential. But meaningful engagement still depends on time, context and power related challenges. Ultimately, community engagement is far more than a box to be ticked by relocation planners. To conclude, time is of the essence here. The window in which we can ask big questions, dream imaginatively, and learn about what makes these planned relocations have better outcomes is quickly closing. We, can, we need to learn from the past, including these lessons about community engagement, but we also need to imagine wildly beyond what's happened before. We need evidence-based and imaginative rights-respecting policies today to help people move or stay with dignity tomorrow. After all, 
To fail to plan is to plan to fail. Thank you. Wow, I really like that last quote, <laughs> I must say. Thank you, Erica. This was such a great and informative presentation. I learned a lot and thank you for these those resources. I'm definitely gonna look them all up. Um, let's start with the Q&A. Uh, we have about uh, 12, uh, 14 or 16 minutes, I think. Uh, so lots of time for a good question. Q&A session. We don't have any Q&A questions coming in yet from the audience. So I will start off with one. So um, plan relocation uh, sounds like a really good idea in theory and in practice. So why do you think states are so slow to do it or rather resistant to it? Hmm. I'm not sure if it's always really such a good idea. I think it has the potential to be, but existing evidence illustrates that more often than not, these relocations have serious risks to people's rights, to their livelihoods, that there are negative outcomes over time. So I think a lot of the resistance from governments comes from a really grounded understanding of the challenges at stake. Hmm. What we also know is that when these relocations are well-planned, and well supported, and there's high levels of community engagement, outcomes are better. So that could be compelling evidence for trying and adapting. And I think we see a growing number of governments starting to ask these questions, just given the sobering realities of climate change eroding landscapes and habitability. Thank you. So um, we actually have a couple of questions coming in, and I'll just I'll just do a follow up question on uh, your answer. Um, you know, community engagement as well as I mean, did you find any any? I mean, I'm sure there's literature, but what did you find on the tensions between host communities and displacement communities? What can we do better in terms of engaging or bridging the gap between these two different kinds of communities? Yeah, it's a great question. Host communities are essential yeah. in this context, and they're not often the first and foremost on relocation planners' minds. And the mm -hmm. refugee and IDP discourses and worlds of practice, host communities are front and center, but adaptation planners that come from climate science backgrounds aren't necessarily socialized to prioritize. Yeah. Um, what can be done Consult, engage those communities as well. Make sure they are front and center in the decision-making process. Before a new site is selected, make sure that their needs are being addressed and make sure that whatever services are provided to a relocating community, such as a new school, a new hospital, better access to electricity or to water, sanitation services, make sure that those services are also being provided to the host communities. So there's a developmental principle here, making sure that, um, a right to an adequate standard of living is that the same standard of living in the place of origin and the destination are met, or ideally it's improved in that new site and that host communities also get access to that same improvement. Oh, yeah, that's, that's expensive. That's... And yeah. to your earlier question about barriers to supporting this, I think the high cost is a huge, yeah. huge barrier. Um, so, we did get a question on the funding and uh I'll, I'll take that question first so the question from peter pens um what if funding and skimpy what has to come first and that you could answer that in any sort of you know from any sort of angle from host displaced or even within the internal you know community internal to the communities that are being moved or re yeah. relocated <laughs> thank you for this question it's the elephant in the room yeah, no, absolutely, yeah. These are such costly endeavors and even more costly to do well. So how do you make decisions with limited resources? This raises yeah. a lot of challenges around distributive justice between communities. How do you allocate limited resources? Is it based on exposure, based on historical marginalization? But then also within a community, what do you prioritize first? In practice, I've seen community structures like 
community centers, heritage museums, um, community gathering places as something that a lot of communities really, really, really want to prioritize, even with limited resources. Um, I think what it ultimately depends on what the priorities of the community is. You can't, there's no overarching principle here. Mm -hmm. um, but I think this is an extremely important challenge. We've seen a wide range of different funding sources. So there are some examples like in Ildijan Charles in Louisiana where the government has provided funding. Fiji now has a trust fund that they've developed both to tax tourists, but also to accept donations, for example, from New Zealand government to fund these moves. <clears throat> but other communities are grappling with other strategies, um, whether they go to the Inter-American Development Bank or the World Bank, they might go to an NGO. Some communities self-fund. They use their own uh, savings. They rely on remittances. Dr. Sue's work speaks to this. There's a lot yes. of options. Some crowdfund. They make crowdfunding platforms on websites to request. Uh, so then we have another question. Um, Kirsten London Smith asks, what, if any, differences did you see between Indigenous and non-Indigenous community examples? Yeah, it's a brilliant question. I think these cultural heritage dimensions are important everywhere, but they're particularly important in Indigenous communities. So prioritizing, um, building that museum, building mm -hmm. the new, um, convening center in a traditional indigenous style, the same as in the origin site. Um, prioritizing funding for culture is a key distinction. I also think a lot of communities have very strong attachments to land. Right. And indigenous communities often have uniquely strong cultural and livelihood attachments to land. So they're often choosing to stay voluntarily immobile. That's the academic phrase, but what that means in practice is just they choose to stay. They don't want to move. So bringing the heart into the calculations along with the mind, right? Mm. All right. Um, uh, we have uh, Kati Rilsundapan asking, how do you differentiate the community activism from community engagement in planned relocation or both? Or are, are are both similar, or both are similar? Yeah, I love this question. I think community activism <laughs> be a form of engagement. Okay, it's a self led form. It's we use the term engagement rather than participation because it's inclusive. Activism would be a part of it. Okay. Okay, that's good to know. I didn't know the difference either, actually. Okay. Um, what is the process? I mean, actually, that's is asking. What is the process of community engagement in case of forced displacement in practice? Is that a long sort of question or answer, or would you be able to answer that quickly? <laughs> Seems long. Can you can you repeat the question? Uh, what is the process of community engagement in case of forced displacement in practice? Yeah. It's a great question. Oh, yeah, it is. Placement scholars have been grappling with this for decades. I think planned relocation is a little bit unique from a classic forced displacement setting because there's more time. It's huh. less of an abrupt forced move but more anticipatory about the future. Um, in cases of forced displacement that are really abrupt, community engagement can often take that more tokenistic form, the, the lower rung, where an NGO or government will come to the community and say, okay, what do you need? Non-food items, temporary shelters. Okay, you need some water, great, we'll, we'll bring some the next day or a week. But it's often less meaningful and inclusive and visionary about the future than in these planned relocation scenarios. Yeah, that's a great answer. Thank you for that. Um, Dr. Sue, Yvonne's asking, 
How do we avoid community washing? I wanted to ask that as well. <laughs> when, we are, when we are doing our work as consultations can mean different things to scholars. That's the question. <laughs> really hard. That's Even in the asking you, because I don't know the, <laughs> I don't know the answer. And, and, and I think it's all it's great that you brought up the term community washing because we're so used to it in other things like greenwashing or even climate change washing. But community washing really gets at the heart of it because I think we all struggle with this question: how much engagement is is enough engagement? And and if you had, can can shed any light on that, because we know you've done so much community work, that would be great. Yeah, I mean. Making people, giving people a seat at the table to make the decisions alongside you, treating them as equal partners through participatory action research approaches, if it's in an academic research setting, um, making sure that the power dynamics that inevitably exist are named up front and intentionally explored um, and mitigated to the extent that that's possible. Providing funding to members of one of these relocating communities so that they can use it in whatever way they see fit for research or for other purposes. Um, valuing indigenous knowledge and local knowledge as, as meaningful and valuable as um, IPCC projections of sea level rise in a model. Um, those are just a few, a few first reflections. In the paper, um, there are some more critical questions and, and um, suggestions for future research as well as future policy and practice in this space. Um, Thank you for sharing that. And I, and I think the advice to name the power imbalances and the privileges from the beginning is very helpful because I think it, it's even some of my work, it comes up anyways. And I feel like sometimes when scholars try to avoid it because they feel like they shouldn't, and it's almost weird to to try to avoid noting that you have a powerful position by not talking about it. And in and, and experiences that I've had where it comes up later, it's almost much worse because it seems like because you're not you're making it seem like you're secretive or you're hiding things when really you're actually trying to combat something. So I think your advice to kind of address it head on is actually the best for everybody, the researcher, as well as the, the communities. Thanks, Erica. And to be honest, just to talk, and as a student, um, I would say doing something like that is quite it takes a lot of courage. There's so much peer pressure around you to do, you know, to be secretive, to be fake, um, that it, it takes years and years of experience to build up that courage to be yourself and show yourself. All right, we have, so we can take another couple of questions. Um, somebody had a gender equity question. Where did it go? Okay, so Nira El Guetta, uh, her questions, Question is, question on gender equity regarding leadership when creating community solutions uh, such as these, like on big issues such as these, can you comment on the gender division of community engagement and leadership? So perhaps connected to your intermediaries role. Yeah, I think this is such an important question, Nira, and the gender dynamics are omnipresent. Um, oftentimes, when an intermediary is interviewed or when a community is engaged, it's the elder male chief and women's perspectives are not front and center. Um, or if they are, it's in a separate focus group and it's to get the women's views intentionally, which is well-intentioned, like it's with a good impulse in mind, but then it becomes um, not as meaningfully, it's not always as meaningfully considered. The inputs are not always meaningfully considered moving forwards. Um, I'm just thinking about an example in Fiji and Vanita Lagoa where women's voices were not front and center in site design and the new houses did not include kitchens. Oh. They did what? not include kitchens. So the community members then had to build those for themselves. And had women's voices been front and center all along in the decision making, that wouldn't have happened. Um, I'm doing some work now in the Solomon Islands with some communities where land tenure is patriarchal and or patrilineal, and therefore women don't have access to make decisions about whether or not to move to new land in the same way that men do, and therefore societally they're not able to make 
to be as involved in these decision making. Even if they're consulted, they can't, they don't hold the power to make the decisions. Um, so I, we talk so much about the importance of preserving culture in a relocation process, but what if that culture is patriarchal and there's a lot of machismo and a lot of elements around gender in particular that the community doesn't want replicated at the new site? Is preserving the culture really the goal or is thinking about how climate adaptation and the relocation can be a conversation space to reimagine what those societal structures look like? Um, I think there are some communities that are actively grappling with these um, questions right now. And Ryan Al Alaniz is a scholar who's done some work on Honduras and relocations, resettlement in that context, thinking about precisely this question around gender dynamics. I guess a related uh, issue would be who selects who? I mean, how are these intermediaries selected? Are they nominated? Are they elected? Who? Who's making those decisions? It is so complex. Well, I think we've run out of time. Thank you so much, Erica. This was a great session. Thank you, Yvonne, for joining us. Uh, and thank you to everyone else who's joined us and sent us your questions. This was an amazing third session. And uh, Erica, please join us if you have time in the other sessions that we will hold next year. Now, uh, can I plug something real quick? Yeah, yeah go ahead. So um, the Center for Refugee Studies is having our summer course. And we'll be talking about climate migration, imagining uh, climate migration futures. Um, I believe Dr. Erica Bauer has agreed to come in June <laughs> to be, and uh, it might be peer pressure here now, but if not, she'll join us online. Um, but all this to say that, you know, the engagement is really, really excellent in the, in the Q&A, and I'm sure many of you have even more questions. So if you could, um, if you're interested, I'll drop the link into the chat. Uh, and consider coming to our summer course and engaging in more of these conversations with brilliant people like Dr. Erica Bauer. Thank you so much for your time, Erica. Thank you again. Um, thanks, Yvonne. I'll be there from Malawi. <laughs> All right, Francesco, you have the floor to end this great session. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you, uh, Dr. Bauer, for that great presentation um, and for the great discussion. I'm sorry we couldn't get to all of the questions. There's a few good ones there. So I did put my email uh, in the chat if anybody wants to follow up with me. Um, I'll do my best to pass them along to Dr. Bauer. And um, whenever she has a chance to get back to us, um, I'll uh, pass the answers along. Um, and just as a reminder to anybody who would like to revisit this uh, session or any of the sessions in this series, uh, they are posted, the recordings are posted both on the CFL York website and on the CFL York YouTube channel, which I shared earlier in the chat as well. Um, the recording should be up within the next couple of hours. Um, so please feel free to revisit the session and share it within your networks to anyone who might not have been able to make it for the live session here today. Um, and also thank you to you, Dr. Sue and Nell for helping put together this session and all of the sessions that we've had so far. Um, we really appreciate all of the help and support from the Center for Refugee Studies. Um, and also, of course, thank you to everyone in the audience for taking the time to be here today and for engaging with Dr. Bauer and the presentation. Um, and so with that, just one last big final thank you. Um, and just to note that, as Nell mentioned a little bit earlier, this is the last session for the year, but not for the series. So we will be back on January 22nd to continue these discussions on climate change displacement. So um, please join us and for all of you who are already registered, the registration is the same. Um, so you'll automatically be notified for the next session. But if you wanna mark it down on your calendar, it's January 22nd for the next one. So thank you all so much. Um, I hope everybody has a great rest of their day. Um, and yeah, it was a fantastic session. Take care, everyone. Thank you, Erica. Happy holidays. Yeah, and happy holidays to everybody. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Care, everyone. Thanks again. Thank you. Yeah.